Hello, I'm Ed Gallagher, president of the American Scandinavian Foundation and Scandinavia House, and I'm welcoming you to the virtual Scandinavia House in New York and virtual roundtable discussion on indigenous activism in the Nordic countries with Sami artist Sofia Janik, Inuk anthropologist and indigenous rights activist Kiviak Lubstrom, and Sami activist Beska Nilas, moderated by Inuit wildlife and conservation biologist and ASF fellow Victoria Bushman. The panelists will look at what comprises activism among indigenous people in the Nordic countries and how others can support them. This program is one of many that are presented by the American Scandinavian Foundation and the virtual Scandinavia House on ScandinaviaHouse.org. Consult ScandinaviaHouse.org for a full list of programs, which include other panels, children's events, exhibitions, and lectures. And now it's my pleasure to welcome our moderator and panelists. Welcome. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who is joining us. If you feel like sharing where you're joining from, we would love to hear in the comments. Um, we uh, obviously are not meeting in person, so this can be uh, a little bit challenging for us, but I'm very, very excited to be sitting with so many other incredible activists today. Um, I myself am a biologist, but you have heard that we have um, artists and anthropologists and, and uh, fishers and, and whatnot today. Uh, we have a lot of people. Um, I'm really excited about these three specifically because um, I know I know two of them, Beska and Kaviok, we've already met before and today I'm very excited to learn a little bit more about Sophia. Obviously we're in a time where indigenous activism is becoming a much more spoken about issue, a lot more indigenous rights and indigenous issues are being asserted globally. And I'm really glad to hear about it from the perspective of folks who are citizens of Scandinavian Nordic countries. Um, I myself am not, but I've lived in Greenland for some time now. So I'm really excited to hear about what's going on on this side of the water um, so that we can learn from each other uh, and, and move forward together as we can. All right, we have a series of questions. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We're just gonna have a nice little dialogue. Um, so it's without saying you're all indigenous activists. Um, can you tell us what kinds of issues you are working on and what kinds of issues are being addressed in your regions? Um, maybe you could go ahead and start, Kaviok. Yeah, thank you. It's a privilege to be able to be here and speak on behalf of so many other knew it. Um, I myself started out with working uh, on children's and youth issues and uh, have later on moved on to be an advisor for a global indigenous youth cau caucus where I used to be a co-chair and so the focus used to be in that area for me and uh, lately I have been working uh, in Uraninamic, which is an anti-uranium mining organization um, here in Greenland. And we have been really successful. Uh, we got a new election and <laughs> we have a new government that is actually against uranium mining. So we have been really good at doing all of this. But yes, um, focus is really spread out, but we also have uh, the privilege of having our own self-government in Greenland. And because of that, we have been able to have people that have specific focus on youth and children rights. And we have others that have focus on, on, uh, on climate change and others that are more focused on, uh, on other areas uh, like culture and language revival. So, um, so this is what has been going on here in Greenland. Thanks so much. Maybe we can hear from you, Sophia. Yes, hello everyone. I'm Sophia Janok from the uh, uh, Swedish part of Sápmi. I'm from a uh, Sámi reindeer herding community called Loktamavas. And well, my 
all, all my energy kind of goes to at the moment is trying to protect our ancestral land from the devastating forestry industry, which is really, really bad here in, in, in Sweden, probably in the, in the whole area of, of Sápmi, but uh, the largest uh, forestry company of Europe, Svea School, uh, they are continuing the, the colonizing <laughs> strategies with uh, plenty of lies and uh, disrespect against us. So uh, in, uh, in November, October, November, it got clear that they hadn't heard our, our will to leave the last remaining forest uh, piece for our reindeer to survive uh, till the next spring. So uh, we uh, collected all our strength and tried to get uh, attention from media and, and uh, public opinion. And, and we managed to at least pause uh, the logging plans of 700 hectares to start with in our community. And this is something that is uh, not unique for our uh, district. Uh, so we got 29 Sami reindeer herding communities to sign an open letter and the biggest newspaper. Um, that's where school has to finally, at some point, respect our voices. And this is still on at the moment. There are activists out there in a different district uh, trying to stop the machines from logging. So this is probably the, the main cause at the moment. But of course, we also have wind power uh, threats and, and new mines coming up. Uh, and uh, the tourism in the mountain area has uh, increased uh, a lot uh, because of COVID. And this also uh, is threatening the life of the reindeer uh, in areas where they usually are uh, being at peace during the summertime. So we have a lot on our plate. Yeah, it's always really interesting to hear what's going on in Sápmi because I haven't spent very much time there. So thank you for sharing that. Maybe Peska, you can let us know also what you're working on. Uh, yeah, try to keep this brief. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, uh, Sofia uh, mentioned the, the main issues are, are the land protection work we have to do all the time. So, so there are many, many, many issues right now. And one of the biggest ones that just uh, got in the news that now they are planning the startup is the Nusir Asa mine, a copper mine, uh, mine in, in uh, uh, close by to my area here by the coast where they are planning to to get the mining waste, toxic mining waste, in, uh, and dump it into the to the fjord. And it will destroy both the fjord and, and also the grazing lands uh, connected to the fjord for the reindeer. So that's a huge issue uh, we are working on right now. And also I see in the, in the uh, issues we are going to talk about, uh, for example, the, the green, green uh, uh, new future, uh, which is... Uh, a very, very big uh, uh, threat to us uh, here in Sápmi. And I'm talk, uh, thinking about the wind, wind power uh, plants, mm -hmm. like they are, uh, they are supposed to solve the, the, the uh, energy needs of the world. And uh, we have to pay the price for them. Uh, they are very, very destructive for, for uh, Sámi livelihood and, and culture and especially for the reindeer herders, but not only for the Sami communities but, and the people, but, uh, but also for many others. So those are the two big things. And it, it comes down to land, land and also water, and, and trying to protect them as, as best as we can. Yeah, and I, I live on the Norwegian side of, of the borders in in Sápmi, so I'm up in far, much further north than Sofia. Yeah, thanks so much for that. I know that uh, indigenous activism is sort of necessitated by a lot of colonial forces and one that we can't overlook, I think talking about today is the idea of green colonialism. 
And there does seem to be a lot that is happening in Sakmi right now um, that is worth discussing, I think. And we're going to come back to that a little bit about uh, climate change and activism around responses to that. Uh, but first, um, I'd, I'd like to focus a little bit for folks who are coming from parts of the world where they're maybe not so familiar with indigenous peoples in the Arctic. All four of us are indigenous peoples, but we're also different, right? And so indigeneity in itself can be really difficult to, to define and to talk about. So how do you define it? And are there any issues we need to consider as we move forward? Maybe, does anybody want to start? Well, I can start. Uh, well, for me, it's not that hard to define. I belong to the Sami people and, uh, and uh, we have been living here for time immemorial and also recognized as indigenous peoples uh, like in the UN, by the states and so forth and by other indigenous peoples. So, so for me personally, it's not a, a big deal. I, I know where I belong and, and what my indigeneity is. Uh, where it can get tricky is when, when you don't know where you belong. And, but I'm not the right person to, to ask about that, uh, that uh, challenge. Uh, so, so, well, I'll, I'll leave it there and, and pass the ball on. I can maybe come with an example of when you have grown up uh, uh, with textbooks where that of being indigenous is considered to be something from the past. Uh, both in Danish and Norwegian, they use the term urfolk sometimes when it comes to indigenous people. And uh, especially in Danish, they don't really, they don't use that language anymore. But it was a, a really demeaning way of describing indigenous people uh, and Aboriginal people as something that is of the past and is not something that lives in the present. So growing up with that idea and uh, growing up with uh, the notion that you have to be a modern Greenlander uh, for the longest time, I couldn't, uh, I didn't even consider myself indigenous for some of my childhood because I just considered myself Greenlandic, Galalo. And for some reason, the idea of being Greenlandic and being indigenous were not put together. Um, so it was first later on when I became older that I could put two and two together and realize that, yes, I am indigenous. And that is also because in Greenland, we live in our own island so we don't have the direct contact with colonizers in the same sense that other indigenous peoples do. Uh, so we're the majority in our country. And because of that, sometimes I would have a weird feeling of, uh, of otherness when I talk to other indigenous people because my reality and my experience of colonialism is so different. Uh, even though there are extremely many similarities as well, of course, but uh, so growing up here in Greenland, um, we had to, uh, we have, at least my generation have to fight against this indoctrination that we have gotten that we are not indigenous. Uh, so, uh, so just the fact that there's so many of us who nowadays proudly present ourselves as indigenous is a huge victory. I, I find similarities with both Kivyok and Beska, as Beska mentioned, I personally, I have no, never had any troubles defining myself, but I still get surprised uh, when meeting people here in the north of Sweden, uh, living in cities that has uh, Sami names, and still, as Kivjok said, uh, thinking we are something from the past. Uh, institutions and so on, mentioning Sami people here, as here Sami used to live here, the reindeer used to graze and so on. And this is happening as we speak. And, and this is really surprising to me, to me every time, even among my non-Sami friends, sometimes I have to like um, 
they, they, they can ask questions like, but what evidences are there that you are really indigenous um, and so on? So that is, um, that is a, like a gap between our reality and the non-Sami reality. Yeah, thank you for that. I know that um, as we move forward, it is so powerful to be able to take our indigeneity and assert that because they are our protected rights. They are um, recognized on the international level and they are what makes us us and gives us the right to continue to be who we are and to uh, practice not only our culture, but to move forward into a future where we are still allowed to exist, right? So, what are some things that we think are common misconceptions about our peoples and about our rights and about activism about our rights? Do you have any thoughts? Uh, one thing I at least uh, uh, struggle with sometimes is that uh, uh, the way uh, we look uh, our Sami is sometimes being uh, misunderstood as, as being Swedish or Norwe Norwegian because the skin of the color of, of my skin. Um, so that, that is sometimes tricky even among other indigenous peoples uh, sometimes actually uh, or people asking whether I'm quarter or half or, or uh, things like that. So that's one misunderstanding about uh, Sami. Um, Yeah, this idea of, of people not having people not having the experience to know that, you know, there are also light skinned Inuit and there are like, there's not some set archetype for any of us, right? Myself as well. Um, these are things people don't have experience with, right? And, and you have to have the curiosity to find out. Kaviak, did you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to point out that uh, in Greenland, we have since the 70s, actually even before that, had uh, a notion where we want to become independent one day. And uh, it is something that a lot of people still want and st still talk about. And uh, there's this notion amongst Danish people I often experience where they feel like there is an ancient Danish sentiment, which is actually not the case. It's just a wish for independence. And people sometimes seem to feel uh, that the need for independence comes from a place of hate, even though it, it simply comes from a place of uh, love for ourselves and for our own culture, and that we appreciate the differences between the Danish and the Greenlandic culture. And I think it's also because of uh, uh, even if we do become independent, it will not be able to sever the connection between Denmark and Greenland, uh, even though we are so geographically far away from each other, because Greenlandic people have grown up with Danish culture in us and with us and amongst us. Uh, we grew up with Danish television and radio and uh, film and popular media. Uh, nowadays, because of the internet, we get more of the international media and uh, but there's still a strong connection to Denmark. So I just wanted to point out that there's a lot of notions amongst uh, Danish people that if you're an activist and you are an indigenous rights activist from Greenland, that you are anti-Denmark and that is just not the case. Yeah, and, uh, and one more misconception I see all the time is that whenever we are demanding or fighting for our rights then then uh, people somewhat believe that then we want more than the others uh, when we actually want the same as the others like language language rights right to education right to our livelihoods right to exist so it's basic human and, and indigenous rights we are fighting for we are not fighting to get above anyone else. And that's really, really deeply rooted, at least in the North, where, where people are, are sometimes uh, very full of hate and, and, uh, and racism uh, because of this mis misconception. 
uh, Samis are seen like these conquerors that are, that are going to throw away people from their homes when, when it's not at all the case. We just want equality, not, not uh, superiority, if I put it that way. Right, there's a, a lot to do with sovereignty and self-determination of our peoples that perhaps others feel like is an assertion beyond what they think we deserve. But the truth is they are basic human rights um, to education, to language, to use of our lands and waters. Um, we might not have had uh, countries in the same context, but we had our own homelands and we still have our own homelands and we have a right to those homelands, right? One thing that I'm actually a little bit curious about because there are two and two of us here is that Kiviak and I are both Inuit, but from different countries. Our, our, our homeland span four countries. And I believe your homelands of Sapmi also span three, four countries, right? Three, not Russia, four, <laughs> four. <laughs> this is also a tricky thing, right? Because we are also asserting our rights beyond sort of national jurisdiction. We're not fighting just in our own countries. We're fighting in a system of countries um, and, and just to, to put ourselves out there. Um, another thing we should talk about, um, along these lines, what do you think are some of the most important issues being addressed by activists right now? And what do we wish we had the capacity to address? A lot of things that I've already heard about were a lot about natural resource extraction. This one is really important. We've ha heard about logging uranium, wind farms, tourism, Copper mining, which I'd actually be curious in listening a little bit more to Beska because I'm also wondering about the impacts to the fisheries in the fjord. Um, green colonialism, um, these kinds of things. Uh, what, what, what do we need to be addressing right now? I think one of the things that I recognize or see similarities among indigenous peoples that I never have to explain when talking to sisters and brothers and relatives around the world, but seems to be lacking entirely in the colonizing part is, is that everything is connected. Uh, uh, the water, the land, uh, us being part of our, our, our identity is being part of, of the surroundings. And once you get that, then, then they are not different things. They are actually the same things of, of, the, of our common home. Um, and it's all, it all goes down to respect uh, for our home, for the surroundings, for one another, for the ancestors and the future sisters and brothers. And, and then you can, when you get that, then the copper mine, the, the logging, the, the, the fjords and everything, it's all, it's all the same. Um, and this, this is really hard to explain to one who has a completely different philosophy. Um, this, is, this is, to me, the hard part, because it would be so much easier if, if, uh, if indigenous peoples were let in to the tables where decisions are made and when, where we can actually explain these things on a higher level. Uh, to multiple people uh, at once, because this is a change that needs to happen fast, immediately, yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all really good points. Um, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I, I wanted to point out that this idea of everything be, being one thing at a time is a re really Western way of thinking. It's not really part of indigenous way of thinking, in my opinion. Most of the people I have met from various indigenous communities and peoples tend to know that everything is connected, that there's something going on. If something is wrong in this area, it will affect everything else. And as well, so that's also why it, I have always uh, known that I wanted to work internationally when it comes to indigenous rights as well, because if it goes well for one people, in one area, we can use that as an example to point it out to other nations and and ensure that everyone can be lifted. Um, and uh, I have 
participated in, in the UN Permanent Forum and, and I'm still uh, sometimes an advisor of Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. Uh, so uh, I uh, like to stay in contact with people from various different organizations and agencies because I know that we can help each other out and we can send a message, okay, we need someone from Guatemala to say something about this. So um, it's really important to have community and it's really important to have a network where you can connect with other people who are going through similar things or even completely different things from your own people. But um, for example, I know that many places in the world, there is a struggle when it comes to food security. And, uh, and we all have various different ways of dealing with it, but we can help each other out. And so for me, this communication with other indigenous peoples from all across the globe has really been a huge, huge help. Yeah, that's so good to hear, Basica. Well, the two of you, you are so good at answering. I don't know what to say anymore. So uh, I'll just build on what, what the two of you just said. Yeah, it's all, all connected. And uh, where was I going with this? Uh, yeah, I was going to... to we, we are on the receiving end of this massive, massive, massive uh, intrusion. And, and uh, we, when, when the question is, what should we be addressing? Uh, we are addressing all that we, we can address. We don't have the power to do anymore. We are few people, we have too much work and, and we just keep on, on fighting the flames, so to say. So, so there are, of course, many issues we would rather do like building our language, like building our culture, like building our strength and, 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 and uh, our, our uh, communities. But we don't, have the, we don't have the resources, not humanly or, or monetarily, because we are forced into this never ending war of, of destruction. So, so that would be my like dream scenario if we, could uh, just stop all of that that fighting, then we really would uh, ha have the strength to 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 be building it instead. But the ones on the other side, they are like they don't just see their own noses, but we see see all the noses or faces coming at once. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that was my my take on it. I think that's a really, really, really good analogy. And you're so right. There are so many things that we have to fight for every day that we're not even focusing on the things that we would like to do for our own peoples, right? Because we're always putting out these fires. I think this is a really good segue into talking a little bit more about green colonialism, specifically because like, we're in a time where environmentalism is becoming a really, really important topic all across the world, internationally in all of our fora. But one of the problems that I see is that people don't know the Arctic like we know the Arctic. And so a lot of decisions are being made sort of on the outside to address environmental challenges. And people don't realize that those solutions are not good solutions. And then they are then forced upon us and they don't realize the impacts that they have on our peoples and why it's detrimental for actual progress as we uh, anticipate and fight climate change. Um, I'm thinking specifically like as a conservation biologist, there are a lot of conservation issues like conservation plans, um, protected areas and things that are developed that are actually counterproductive to to the outcomes that they want to, to see. And I'm really curious what kinds of green colonialism you're seeing, why it's so dangerous. I think people who are here today would really learn a lot about why like, it's so important to have indigenous voices as part of these processes. Would anyone like to go first? I could, since the, 
this Surya school of the forestry industry matter is so present at the moment. This is a very good example of, of green colonialism since they are greenwashing their name all the time. And uh, just now the other day, uh, the company CEO were now saying that they are not logging natural forests on the reindeer area. And this is like, we live there. He hasn't even been to our place. We are there. And he says uh, that to meet the climate crisis, uh, we need to log more trees in order to go from plastic to paper takeaway cups. <laughs> and this is like, it's threatening in not only our lives as indigenous peoples, but all of humanity. It's not a coincidence that the, that the like 5% of the world's uh, population that are indigenous are actually protecting the 80% of the last remaining healthy ecosystems. That is not a coincidence. So I see that green colonialism, uh, the same companies are just uh, using different uh, rhetoric uh, words uh, in, to do, to continue doing business as usual. And we see it very much in the North as the uh, leaders of these companies are way down South uh, and they are still uh, taking the decisions over our heads. Do you want to go next? <laughs> or should I go? It's because I, yeah, I've noticed that you often speak after us, so I wanted to give you the opportunity to go first, so I was quiet for a while. Yes, but uh, for me, I have noticed the fact that it's a continuation of the colonial structure that we recognize, the, the criminalization of indigenous food sources. We have experienced that quite a lot in Greenland and in the Arctic, where a lot of, of food has been deemed too cute to be killed, for example, the seal. And we still have the EU that actively work against uh, seal hunting. They may call it commercial seal hunting, and uh, but and they have the Inuit exception, but it's still a, a thing that really hits us because they have campaigned so hard against this. And uh, now we see that they use this green uh, new way of living as an excuse for all of us to stop hunting and that we have to eat, become vegan like the people in South are able to do. But the thing is eating locally hunted and harvested food is way better for the environment. But many people want us to buy these things that are made, manufactured, uh, produced in uh, Denmark or in other countries uh, so that they can earn their money. And, uh, and I always find this uh, a little hypocritical because Denmark right now is selling itself to the rest of the world as the greenest country. But a lot of the things that they're doing uh, are not what they actually should be doing. So, um, so this thing w that really affects our food and our food security is a huge issue. There's also the other issue where many people talked about how the uranium mining uh, that would be happening in South Greenland if it was to start, which is from an Australian company. So it's not even anything that would benefit the Greenlandic nation. Um, that it would actually mine things that would be better for the environment. And that was one of the things they used to try to sell the idea of having a mine in South Greenland. So uh, it's something we see all over the world where they uh, use the idea of how in the long run this kind of mine and the things that they're mining would be better for the environment. But mines in general are not good for the environment they don't really take that into consideration. Yeah, uh, totally agree. And I, I appreciate the concern to let me speak, but I, I like to speak last and I can listen to wise words first. Uh, yeah, about yeah, the greenwashing of, of the different industries. Also this copper mine is, is uh, labeled as a, a, a green project. Uh, they will have uh, electrical digging machines, 
electrical electrical uh, dumping machines with the waste and so forth and also that the copper is needed for the green shift that the world needs because the electricity has to go through the copper lines and so on uh, no one in that company mentions that the, the biggest user of copper in the world is the military industry for weapons so so it's not as green as as uh, stated uh, but that, that that's maybe one of the biggest problems or or the hardest one to crack because all the governments all the co companies are labeling all with with the greenness nowadays whatever the case might be uh, like the power power wind power plants also uh, in in some they are not uh, they are destroying so much nature and uh, and in certain areas they are releasing much more carbon into the atmosphere that than the plant could ever produce or reduce uh, emissions uh, contrary to the, to uh, to the other carbon burning so so we have this huge problem with I I believe maybe it's a media problem or some kind of communication problem because national media for example in Norway Sweden Finland uh, especially they they are only running the errands of, of those green green words uh, and we almost have no way of, of contradicting them uh, in any way because the media doesn't care uh, at all and uh, and also that the uh, when we do things to get the attention of the media, that's also like this very fine balance uh, when, when you have to close down some, some windmill uh, plantation building uh, by closing their, their road uh, just to get some media attention. Then it's very, very delicate situation. Then many people see us just as some some crazy activists that are stopping the, the future because we don't get to explain deeply enough. The headlines, uh, they go by uh, in one day and, and then the issue still remains. So I think, I think media also is, is a very big part of this, uh, this uh, extraction problems we have because they, they don't dig in or they don't ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. So that's for you, media. Can I say something to, to what Beska mentioned here about media? And I, I totally agree that's a huge problem that the knowledge is so low that you believe uh, you, you, you don't even ask a second question. Media don't ask the leaders of these companies the right questions. They just uh, satisfy with, no, but we, like Svea Skog saying, we have never had this much forest in Sweden. That is what Svea Skog is saying. And we know that 70% of the, the, the forest has disappeared in only 50 years. But they don't mention that uh, what they mean with forest are really plantations. And that's a completely different thing. And then media should be asking, what do you mean by these forests? How, how could it be more forests when, when you had never been logging this much? So um, I, I think we have to be more brave or media has to be braver in, in, in questioning and not only believe in these words because it's easier to believe that we are into a green future. That's much, much more convenient and comfortable than I can sit by in my electric car and, and still do nothing. Uh, but actually, like, look behind the words. Like when you call forests plantations, and they say also we plant two trees for every tree we log. And to us, that is a huge problem because planting these uh, foreign contora pine trees is devastating for the reindeer. The reindeer doesn't even pass those plantations. Uh, I can go on and on about this, but I I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I, I th I'm really on this media topic as well, because it's really important. Kavyap, did you also have something to say? 
Yeah, it's I, I have noticed that since uh, social media and the internet became more prevalent in the world, that the sh journalists have a very difficult time keeping up. So a lot of the work they do is basically they get uh, something from someone like uh, 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 and then they'll just read it through and just send it out. There's no investigative journalism in Greenland at the moment. They just get something from the government or from someone else and then they'll be like, okay, I'll, I'll just post it on a website because I want to be faster than the other website. Uh, but what I have noticed from our latest election here in Greenland, uh, a lot of the big subjects that the Danish people the Danish media were focusing on were on the uranium mining in South Greenland in Gwennosor. And what I noticed was when, when they were interviewing people, people that were pro uranium mining did not get any subtitles. So they were seen as someone who was fluent at Danish. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people who were against uranium mining got subtitles, even though they were speaking Danish, as if to say, oh, they're not as good in Danish, maybe they're not as smart as us. And, and the whole coverage of it was made it seem as if Greenlandic people that were against uranium mining were really short-sighted and couldn't see how good it was for the economy to have this. So uh, I did not feel happy about the coverage of the, the election from Denmark. So that's why when they asked me if I could do some answering during the election night, I was like, yes, because I wanted the Danish people to at least have one voice that didn't have a bias. Okay. Uh, so it's just to show that there is also something going on behind the media. They have a bias when they want to express something to their own uh, nation. So they wanted the Danish people to have a certain view of Greenlandic people. Yeah, everything has been these days. Did you have something to say also, Peshka? All right. So um, we're, unfortunately, we only have an hour to do this and we also want to take um, community questions. I've been watching the chat box a little bit. Um, I saw a question that I'm curious about. So I'm gonna ask you, it just came through. What do we feel about a lot of these big environmental NGOs that do a lot of environmental work, particularly in the Arctic now that it's a hot topic, NGOs like WWF, Greenpeace. Um, would we like to chat about that a little bit? Okay, I can go first now. Uh, with some of the big NGOs, we have, uh, or at least me personally, I have a good connection with them and, and in the recent years, they seem to have been trying to, to educate themselves and asking what can we do for you rather than, than, than uh, the opposite. Uh, how, how, what, what the, yeah, they are, they are reaching out. So I, I see that as a positive. They, some of them have a quite bad history with the uh, indigenous issues. Uh, maybe Greenpeace especially and, and Greenland have a have a very bad history and it's still affecting Greenland in a, in a hard way. You mentioned it already. Uh, but, uh, but I believe in allyship myself, uh, but it has to be done right. Uh, so, so they should not at any circumstance talk on behalf of us without us in, in any circumstance. And some, some, not only NGOs, but people, uh, activists, other groups uh, have sometimes done that. And I'm sure it's with good intention and, and with care for the Sami, but without including <laughs> the Sami uh, first and, and, uh, and taking the journey with us and, and not taking the journey by yourself on behalf of us, it can do very much bad. And we have some incidences of, of that. Uh, so, so my 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 advice would be to reach out if you want to help or 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 contribute in any way. Then reach out, uh, but before you reach out, educate yourself, because so much time goes by to educate grown-up people with easy stuff, basic stuff, 
educate yourselves. We have so much on our hands that uh, we really don't have to, the, the time to also, also work as teachers for, for grown-ups. So that would be my, my advice, educate yourselves. Uh, and, and with that said, people who have educated themselves and reaches out and, and come up, up helping with our issues. We have allies in the US, in Canada, in, in Europe, in Germany, in Denmark, in Norway, Sweden, Finland, and in Russia. And those allies are so, so important for us to extend our, our work in, in so many fantastic ways. So, so I'm not saying that you shouldn't come help us, but, but uh, take, take the necessary steps before, before you do so. I love that, thank you. Would anyone like to follow up? I got so moved by your speech, Beska. <laughs> it couldn't be said clearer. Uh, and it's so good to hear that because once once in a while when you say that, I feel a bit guilty of addressing that to non-Indigenous people, but it's really important. Actually listening, educate yourself listening, that is the change the world is aching for, that somebody actually listens to us. Uh, because we have been saying these things for centuries, like this is nothing new. If you read poems of Ailohas in the 80s, if you read Paulus Utz in the 50s, you see that these, we've been saying the same thing uh, all the time. I also agree on Basque on uh, allyship, Vertevuota in, in, in Sami. Um, uh, we have been really successful allying with uh, organizations that had, have done their homework. And this is also because the structural racism in the Nordic countries is really bad uh, towards Sami and indigenous people. And uh, this means that when a Sami says something mm, it, uh, to a CEO or something, it's like, oh, but uh, she's a troublemaker, she's an indigenous activist, no, no, no one to listen to. But when a non-indigenous person says that, then, you, then they listen. So this is a situation that is not good, but therefore also allyship uh, is helpful. It's uh, amplifying our voices uh, because only our voices, we, we, we've seen that it's not enough. So I think it's really important to help by educating themselves as best as that listening and uh, amplifying our voices, not speaking for us, but, but, but with us. Yeah, as uh, Biasca so kindly pointed out, we don't have a great history with Greenpeace in Greenland. Uh, we really don't. Uh, and it's still something that is ongoing because there's no trust. And even when I hear the word Greenpeace, I, I don't trust them at all. And that is something you need to be able to, to collaborate. But luckily, there's so many other organizations all over international and national, and there's the UN, there's the EU that we can work with, and there's all kinds of universities and scientists that are really interested in working with Greenlandic people and, and Inuit and to do something about it because people at, like Greenland, Nuuk is the one area in the world where we have so we, we have so many scientists coming to our country every single year because they're so interested in climate change and in how they can save whales or any other kind of animal that they're interested in. Um, so we do a lot of work, but we, we don't necessarily do it with Greenpeace, but uh, hopefully they will improve. But right now there's no trust and that is a really important thing. And I see that it's... Uh, Someone from Japan that asked that, so Hachimemaste. <laughs> uh, but Victoria and I have lived there, so <laughs> I'm really happy to see someone from Japan being here with us. Um, but yes, uh, if you want to help out or reach out from afar, then you can figure out how to help local organizations in the different parts of the Arctic. Uh, we are really active on social media. I know that the Sami Youth Council also have like Instagram, Twitter and everything. And we, we have the same here in Greenland with various institutions. So you should be able to kind of just Google us and be able to, to support us. 
That's all really wonderful. Thanks all. We are getting a lot of questions about allyship now and about how can researchers be better? How can people plug into our issues? You know, what kinds of resources can they look at to, to, to work with us? And you've all made perfect points that like, you gotta do a lot of that work on your own. But I also think that in these last few minutes, I would like to give you the space to promote any issues that you're working on and any chances people have to plug in or resources like Beska, you have an awesome podcast that you do sometimes in English, like the Supersami on the Land podcast is one of my favorites, and I, I go back and re-listen to that one. Um, is there anything you would like to share, uh, particular things that people could plug into? And if not, that's all right, too, but we're getting lots of interest. Yeah, I would like to take the opportunity to, to point out since this is uh, Scandinavia House hosting this event and, and people from all around the world. Scandinavia is often portrayed themselves as, as this castle of, uh, of uh, human rights to the world. Uh, I would challenge you to look a little bit behind the curtain and then again I come back to, to the educate yourselves. There, uh, and it, it's all connected. It's the media problem. We don't get the voices, our voices heard, but there, are, there, there is very much black things happening here also in Scandinavia. So they are not as innocent as, uh, as they portray themselves, especially to the, to the global audience, Norway, Finland, and Sweden especially. So that would be my, my challenge for you. Look behind the curtain. That's a good one, thank you. Sophia? Yeah, I uh, since this is in such a good spot to, to I want to take the opportunity for the, the ones listening and watching this that supporting uh, us directly uh, with uh, you know ears and and amplifying voices is super great. I run this foundation called Arvas Foundation. It's arvasfoundation.com. And since we started to work uh, on the Sami forests, we've listed uh, at least three ways, three like concrete ways to help. Uh, and it's not only donations, it's listening to songs, it's uh, putting your name on petitions and so on. And if you're uncertain on what organization you should join in between helping us, well, there are, as Kiruk said, there are Sami organizations out there uh, that you can immediate help with. And uh, well, Arvas Foundation is, is one, and, and we're not working only with my district, but uh, the whole of Sapna. Thank you. Anything to add, Kiruk? I think one of the things that I feel that we all agree on is that we should have uh, the sovereignty of our own land. And so if there's something that you want to learn about, we have a hashtag called land back mm -hmm. uh, that you could maybe just find. It's everywhere. You can, there's TikToks, there's Instagrams, there's all kinds of resources when you just hashtag land back where you can learn about it because it's not only about physically getting the land back but it's also metaphysically and, and how it is culturally important for us to be able to claim our land so that is uh, something that i think is a really nice not easy but it's a nice way of coming in to the conversation of what it is that indigenous people want Perfect, thank you. I do want to reiterate exactly what all three of them have said. Like, there's a lot, everybody here has Google at their fingertips. There's a lot that you can go and learn for yourself. Um, I had mentioned a particular podcast that Beska has put together and I would encourage people who are interested in land issues to, to take a look at that. It's a collaboration between Sapni and Alaska. Um, that one I think is really good, but there's tons of resources out there. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions and this was a little bit of a short discussion. Um, but for the people asking in the chat, yes, this will be available to view otherwise uh, 
after this and also the chat will be public. If anyone has trouble with that, please message the organizer and they will remove your comments as appropriate. Well, thank you, Victoria. Um, on behalf of everybody at ASF, I wanna thank you and all the panelists for a uh, most enlightening and provocative discussion. And we take seriously Beska's instructions to look behind the curtain and we're always trying to do that. The ASF has a long history of engaging in cultural and educational exchange in our fellowship and grant program. And you, Victoria, are one of our fellows, has been going for over a hundred years. And this year we have awarded over $780,000 to 69 artists, scholars, researchers, and um, people interested in knowing more about the way the world operates. These are both in Scandinavia, the Nordic countries, and the US. So I wanna thank you all for being with us. This was really a terrific discussion. And uh, again, this is one of many programs we offer at Scandinavia House Online and check ScandinaviaHouse.org to enjoy all of our programs. Now I thank you all. This will be on YouTube and um, we'll encourage your friends to take a look at it. So in the meantime, thank you very much and best fortune. Bye-bye.